and I uh, would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a presentation. Uh, should I? Is it my phone? God. <laughs> I can leave it here. Uh, and uh, we had discussed quite a lot with uh, Sam uh, what would be the topic of my presentation, what would be uh, an interest for the field, uh, because this is a very specific presentation and uh, can be very clinical, can be very academic, and also as a challenge is to find the right balance for uh, the, the right audience. But uh, I think we have to, before we got into the particular presentation, uh, try to uh, link the presentation with an overall theme that we've seen uh, 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 somehow uh, dominating this conference, the theme of person-centered treatment. It's something that came up from the very first presentations on Monday and something that uh, uh, has been referred to by uh, different colleagues doing presentations. And uh, Dr. Constant Mouton yesterday has done a, a very nice presentation uh, with the title uh, Dual Diagnosis. Is this uh, the vehicle to really achieve person-centered treatment? And what does it really mean? It means that how we can move on from approaches that we think they work for approaches they work for the particular individual. In other terms, how we can make what we think that we know from our experience that works, make it work for that particular individual so that particular individual is not lost for treatment or doesn't discharge early from our inpatient facility or doesn't disappear from our patient system. Because as clinicians, not only we have a duty, but they create a lot of existential anxieties within us when we see people coming to us for help and they disappear, they don't come back, or we find that we exhaust our clinical skills and expertise and still we have no effect. And as it happens in science, whenever we have something like that, we give it different names. Uh, it was uh, denial, the person is denial, therefore until somehow by someone, uh, they overcome that denial, we cannot help them, or uh, with the greatest respect to fellowships, someone comes, is an open meeting, if they don't come again, right, we work with people who want to change. But the question is, we are talking about a person-centered treatment. So, it is a treatment that needs to be person-centered. So we have to use what we know from the evolution of science and the development of science to help us answer that particular question. It's not a person-centered chat. It's not a person-centered sharing a coffee. It's not a person-centered uh, going for a coffee and a chat or within a family uh, environment that, 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 that the families and friends will do. We are professionals. We are the ones who suppose we know that something works. Yes? And we want to implement what we think it works for that particular individual. But how do we know that something works? Have you ever thought? It's a combination of things. What we were told that is going to work. So we're all trained on particular models, yes? And we have seen in the presentation that Cosmos has done, or the first presentation on Monday morning is that, you know, if you're trained in a particular university, at a particular time, certain models are more dominant than others. Uh, so if you enter the field as a professional and you are trained into that works and that's how we do it, that becomes for you your professional toolkit to help the others. Uh, if you are a uh, user yourself and you find the solution, as a lot of people, millions of people, millions of people found through fellowships, NAAA, then you want to give back how you are going to give back 
to the others, help the others, using whatever helped you. It's the same sort of thing that uh, friends do. Uh, the friend come to you and say, you know what, I have a headache. And you say, I have a headache myself, and I took that type of medication. Take it, it's going to work. Which is based on our personal experience, and we have the tendency because we have all the good intentions to help others. Yes? Now, there is uh, Moliere was um, quite cynical about medicine. In his play Don Juan, Don Juan, if you don't know the character, he's a famous lover that has no respect for no social norms, no respect for uh, heaven or hell or religion, and no respect for medicine as well. Uh, Don Juan says what the medics do, they take the credit for whatever it works, and if something does not work, they don't want to know about it. Is the patient's fault or they, they haven't really... So it doesn't matter. We take the credit for, uh, by chance, whatever we improvised and we, we did. In addictions in particular, it took a lot of time for us to start standardizing what we do, learn what exactly works, uh, and how we're going to offer what works. And um, from a historical point of view, Possibly that was, because the question that, and it tricked me from Cosmos uh, uh, presentation Monday morning, that possibly the big issue between the AA fellowship and the uh, science in addictions, uh, because somehow uh, calling everybody an alcoholic possibly is a barrier to look into what exactly, how can we measure, are there particular subtypes, how can we investigate further. If everybody's the same, and we have a solution, that that's the end of the matter. But we know it's not the end of the matter. So how does that science move on, treatment-wise? We need to establish what works. Easy, outcome studies. We take a population, we try something, then the golden paradigm nowadays is the randomized controlled trials, randomly allocate to another treatment, you compare and you see what works. That's the starting point. That's the easy bit. And then comes for whom works better. Which means that can we identify from the beginning, before we experiment, before we expose our client to something that might not work, which, in other words, you might ask, is it ethical to expose someone to something that we know might not work? Who might respond to this intervention or what are we going to do with those who are not going to respond to this intervention? And then the third question, which is far more difficult to, to respond methodologically, what works? Uh, how it works, what works? What works for whom and how it works? The how it works is even far more complicated because our interventions usually come with us offering the intervention, a package of sessions, concepts, interactions, the space. Doesn't matter if the intervention takes place in a nice resort by the sea, or does the resort have to be by the mountain? Doesn't matter. You see, is is a multifactorial uh, question that we need to take, break down, and 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 address. So when we approach special populations, not because we want to marginalize people who have special characteristics, to the opposite. Could that help us to? understand better the person that we have in front of us using the signs that tell us for the overall group that they might belong, there are certain things that you need to take into account in order to be able to transform your treatment into a person-centered approach, having into consideration the special characteristics of that individual. Okay? So it's not an effort to it's not a racist effort, it's not a sexist effort. For example, if we're looking into women and substance misuse, is that a sexist approach, that women are different? Because the tendency is that whenever we have subgroups of people, they want to have the same as the main group. But that is a trap. That does not mean that you're going to have something that is going to work because you have special characteristics or special skills or special barriers. So that's my approach, does it make sense? 
is not because I want to marginalize people, I want to put them there, is because uh, the, what I advertise is that if we are not aware of certain common characteristics that those people that we categorized with certain diagnosis have, our treatment might be compromised and we might find ourselves uh, dealing with a lot of existential anxiety. Am I a good therapist? Why the model does not work? As an introduction. So let's move on. So a conflict of interest. I'm going to advertise our new company, Gaia. Christine is here. There is a stand in the uh, room. But the presentation I'm going to do has nothing to do with Gaia. So my presentation is not biased by the fact of the, this company. And as a private psychiatrist, I do practice the London Psychiatry Center. Again, what we're going to discuss has nothing to do with the London Psychiatry Center. So in order to break the problem down to uh, smaller questions in order to be able to analyze and understand it, we need to look uh, how big is the problem that particular spatial population that we're talking about? Are there any particular risks with that population? Uh, are there any particular barriers for that population to access treatment? Usually, the access to the treatment is an average access. Uh, think about uh, uh, the buses, yeah? A bus is made for the average um, British person, and when, when the population was all white English of a height of that to that, then the step to get on the bus should be of that height that the shorter person could step in and the taller person wouldn't really have to compromise too much to get on the bus. When uh, London became a multi uh, cultural society then has to take into account, you know, that there might be people who come from a different continent, their average height is lower, so do we need to modify that? Otherwise, the height will be a barrier for them to use public transport. You can see what I'm getting at. If you have people in a wheelchair, unless you modify your access to the bus, you exclude those people from public transport. It's the same question with treatment services as well. So, uh, and the bars have to do with the people and the special characteristics they have or the services, you know, the, how we build our buses in a way. Um, and of course, what we offer then, once the people are in the treatment, might need to be uh, modified, the content itself, or the people who offer that uh, treatment, ourselves and our team, need to uh, acquire extra skills, different skills, in order to be able to uh, offer our treatment effectively to, to, to that group. Make sense so far? Yes? So we're going to try to address those questions as we explore the two groups, the people with intellectual disabilities and the people with uh, traumatic brain injury. So when we're talking about people with intellectual disability, we're talking about people who have an IQ equal or below 70. Uh, and of course, there are uh, a range of people with an IQ below 70. You have the borderline uh, IQ, people with borderline IQ, who might have a bit of uh, minus uh, or plus 5, so it's anything between 65 to 75 IQ. And you have the people with mild, and then moderate, and the severe um, learning disabilities. This presentation has to do with people with moderate and mild learning disabilities. Uh, now, because I'm educated in the UK, I use the term learning disabilities, the international term intellectual disabilities. I think any term we use is going to have problems uh, because we talk about disabilities and by definition we think that someone doesn't have the same abilities as us. I don't know. I th let's leave the challenge of what is the right term. Uh, so I might use learning, I might use uh, intellectual uh, uh, but you know we're talking about the group that has special needs and special uh, skills. And why we're talking about people with uh, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, why the moderate and mild? Because the service provision for those people changed, the lifestyle have changed. Uh, up to 60s, mid 60s in the UK and most of the countries in, in, in Europe uh, and uh, uh, North America, uh, people used to live in a protected environment. 
uh, in particular homes uh, or in big asylums, more so in, in big asylums. Um, and uh, those people now live in the community, which is a great advantage. When, when, and we'll come to that, when, when you uh, have all good intentions to protect certain people with certain disabilities from the exposure to the challenge of the uh, society, which is just about good enough for the people who don't have disabilities, uh, you, that comes with a price. And the price is that you isolate and you restrict them from uh, certain aspects of life that they're entitled to. As long as your society is ready to modify uh, certain aspects to make the society safer for, for that people. The truth is that, uh, that like any other vulnerable populations, um, that got out of the big asylums, suddenly those people were exposed to the challenges of the normal society. And one of the major challenges of our society uh, at the end of the 20th century and this century is uh, substance use, is alcohol. And I'm not the person, I mean, you might argue about it, I'm not the person who is going to advertise prohibition or clean societies or this and the other. My overall theory behind this is an evolutionary uh, base theory that says we are made to use substances, we are made to develop habits because this is the opposite side of the learning process. We learn and unfortunately we develop habits as well. Something that is a solution becomes a problem and we need to address this problem. So those people who are exposed to that, so we anticipate that those people will be exposed to uh, substance misuse and alcohol. Now the question then is how they're going to cope with that. Have we seen this? Oops. Sorry. I've, uh, where is that? Okay. That's okay. I'll do it from there. Um, the question is with, uh, have we seen this with any other population, yes, we've seen that is well researched with people with mental health problems that left the big asylums and started living in uh, a certain community type of uh, accommodation or uh, living in the community in supported housing, flats, or whatever. Uh, we found that, uh, in particular, the first and second generation of those people were really, really exposed and it was very difficult to protect them or help them uh, uh, protect themselves from the exposure to uh, drugs and alcohol. And the, uh, now we have a technical problem. I think I've touched something. I've lost from the screen and doesn't move up and down. What have I done? <laughs> Simple. You have a problem. <laughs> You're someone who knows how to deal with the problem. You don't improvise. And once I have problems with electrics in the house, and try to fix them, so I destroy the house. So an electrician comes say, uh, said to my wife, what does your husband do? He's a psychiatrist. OK, let him deal with psychiatry. Let me do, deal with the electric. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> the field is divided into that. There is um, a school of thought, like the one which is our starting point to look into that, that like as it happens with people with severe mental illness, where those people left the asylums and they live in the community, they are going to be exposed to that. But there's another school of thought that says, no, the people with intellectual disabilities don't have those needs, don't have the need to uh, drink, they don't have the need to have sex, they don't have the need, is a very paternalistic approach. Uh, it doesn't, is not, before we criticize and, and put it in one side, we have to understand that, uh, and this is usually the carers uh, uh, come up with that, is the need to protect, is the need to protect someone who, who, which we, you know living with them that, um, uh, they, they, are, they are vulnerable. Uh, and one way it is to overprotect them and uh, deny by, with the overprotection uh, certain aspects that uh, needs they have. Um, 
So uh, one of the criticism or one of the, the uh, issues that we had to overcome uh, uh, when we researched into the field was that exactly uh, attitude that was very prominent with social service, but very prominent also with uh, carers, paid carers in particular, uh, supporting those people in the uh, support accommodations. Our clients are do well, they're not exposed into alcohol. Whenever they go to the pub, they go with a member of the staff, they don't drink. Uh, the families uh, are very protective, don't worry about it. So we face that, that attitude. It's a similar uh, situation that you have with, uh, if I'm uh, excused to use religion as an analogy, is as if, you know, Muslim people don't drink because it's not allowed by religion. Yes, that is the norm for most, but what, what happens with those ones who are drinking? There might be few that are drinking, so how do we approach that issue? You see what I'm saying? Is the, yes, the norm might be that, but what about those uh, who have an issue? So what we know from uh, the literature about the magnitude of the problem? Ah, you can see a huge discrepancy there. You can see that something like uh, less than a half a person in 100 people with moderate to mild learning disability, they might have a drinking problem. Drinking problem means alcohol misuse. We're not talking about dependence here. We're talking about drinking more and causing harm. And other studies, we're talking about two and a half percent. And of course, <coughs> the paradox is that the earlier the study, the lower the, uh, the, percent, the prevalence, the later the study, the higher the prevalence, which goes against our hypothesis that the first generation of people coming out of asylum will be faced with that uh, challenge because the service and the treatment system was ready to address it. By observing escalation of prevalence possibly means that because the prevalence of the problems in the society overall is getting worse, it's more likely that the prevalence to that particular uh, population uh, will get worse. Uh, what is important is that half of the people with intellectual disability who drink, they will have a problem. It won't be like us, which is only 6% they will have a, in a, a dependence per se, and 20% will have uh, a misuse problem. Half of the people who are drinking with intellectual disability will have a problem from the alcohol. It means that if you have intellectual disability and drink, it's more likely that drink is going to compromise your quality uh, of life. Um, and there was a particular study, I uh, was reviewing a paper the other day, there was a particular study that was done with uh, population in prison, population in prison with learning disabilities. Almost 95% of the people there which were in prison because of crime, they have an alcohol misuse problem. I think it was alcohol and cannabis, so it was substance misuse problem. It means that can be a major, it doesn't matter how prevalent it is, if a person has the problem, then we can have catastrophic consequences. Uh, the adult psychiatric uh, morbidity prevalence study uh, that was published, uh, uh, that uses data from 2014, came out 2016. We're about to publish our own paper, and we're arguing uh, what is happening with the prevalence overall. Uh, said that 18% uh, of men with intellectual disability, they, they drink alcohol, and 15% uh, of women, which compares to uh, misuse alcohol, compared to 20% of uh, non population with non learning disability, and 14%. So uh, it's, it's very similar, the prevalence. Uh, how many of the people uh, that attending mental health services for intellectual disability have a drinking problem? And that was my initiation into the field. Uh, a study I have done with, at that time, was a specialist registrar, a trainee that was doing her uh, training in learning disabilities. And as they happened, they have special interest session in another field. So she came to do a special interest session in alcohol services with me and she wanted to become, as she is now, a consultant in learning disabilities. Therefore, that was one of the things she wanted to look at, lifestyle. Uh, do they drink, do they smoke? Uh, uh, what is their eating uh, style they have? And we found that in a population 
attending mental health services, uh, uh, learning disabilities mental health services, their prevalence was 22.5%. Uh, which in a way, when we started doing our own research, that was a wrong starting point because <coughs> we thought that would be the prevalence across the population, where it was the prevalence within the mental health services. So that goes together with uh, what maybe we observed in prison. People in prison with learned disabilities, the majority of them will have a drinking problem. And possibly, uh, of course, you expect that there will be interaction between alcohol and mental health problems. Therefore, there is an over-representation in uh, those particular services. Uh, and about five out of 100 people in our normal uh, alcohol services uh, and those, the, those, that research was the back in late 90s uh, where we had the NHS services were looking, uh, taking care of dependent uh, drinkers. 5% um, of those uh, people will have a degree of intellectual disability. And before Victoria started working with me during the special interest sessions, I was not able to spot them. I was trained as part of my training as psychiatrist. I've done six months in uh, service in learning disabilities, uh, but it never crossed my mind that clients coming to me uh, for an alcohol problem, they might have a learning disability. And uh, for her, it was so easy. She said, Chris, we need to measure the IQ for that person who might ha need to have the notes for that person who might need to ask the question, have they been to a special school or not? Uh, so for me, it was, I was totally ignorant before Victoria. So all this is uh, credit to Victoria. To Victoria. Uh, so you can see, th so the, the prevalence is, you know, there's a huge range of what it is. And trying to understand uh, another element will be, does it have to do with the screening tools we're using? Are we over-diagnosing uh, uh, an alcohol misuse problem in that population? Because our screening tools are developed for people who don't have learned disability intellectual disability. You can see now how big is the problem. We try to approach and measure a problem using maybe tools that they are not validated for that population. We don't know. Do they measure the same sort of thing? Or is as if you try to do a questionnaire in a different language. It's more likely if I don't, I'm Greek. If someone comes and do a, uh, a questionnaire for me in uh, a language that I don't understand, English or Greek, is more likely I will go along with the tone of the voice, the, uh, and I will most likely, if I don't want to embarrass myself that I miss something, and that happens sometimes even with in conversations, in a pub in particular, I will smile or I will nod, yeah, because I don't want to expose. Actually, I didn't get what exactly is the question. <coughs> that can be a problem with, with people with uh, learning disabilities. Definitely we know what, what says that, that people with uh, intellectual disability have reduced verbal communication skills. So we asked them a question which we has not been modified to understand it, but also to respond to it, we might get a false response. Uh, they might be more suggestible. It might all have to do with how we phrase the question. And they will guess, do they need to agree or disagree? I'm a doctor and I'm doing my master's in uh, how big is the alcohol problem uh, with people who have an intellectual disability like yourself? Uh, can I ask some questions? Oh, I like that doctor. I'm going to help her. I'm going to answer yes to the question. You see how easy it is to, to get the wrong answer. Um, and as I said, they might try to mask the difficulties by uh, pretending and imitating and give whatever. And this is a problem also. Imitation uh, is a problem also when you have those people in a group. When you have the people attending your uh, reception, they will pick up behaviors. They will be in a group and they will note, or you might think that they understood what is a challenge or what they have to do. And it's more likely they will just go along with the whole thing because it is embarrassing for them to <coughs> acknowledge they don't understand. And as I said, there will be barriers. 
that had to do with um, us, the providers, the, um, the paternalistic attitude that we have. There is a problem, but we don't want to look at it because we feel very guilty and very embarrassed recognizing that, yes, of course, we want to protect those people. We want to offer the best. At the end of the day, uh, they might have issues that we don't know and don't understand. So what we need to do in the field is that the screening tools need to be modified. The people that they use the screening tools need to be trained of how to use the appropriate language and not lead to false answers. And the carers need to be open-minded to look into there might be potentially a problem. And it's easy to say rather than uh, to do, for example, are you familiar with the audit screening tool that we use? Uh, there are two questions at the very end of the audit. Was there a, have you ever been told by a professional that alcohol is a harm, the last year or ever? And have you been in, uh, involved in an accident or a, a loved one in an accident last year uh, ever? Those questions are more likely to be scored yes. So you have eight points just because you are a person with intellectual disability living in a protective environment. Immediately you are under a spotlight. You can have the rest of the questions could build your score above eight. So the sensitivity of the overall audit question to discriminate misuse is compromised. Make sense? Because the aim of the screening tools is to take apart and screen. If by definition, everybody in that population answer yes to a question, that question doesn't have any discriminative validity. It needs to be dropped. So what sort of treatment and modification do you need to do? You already were started. I started on this uh, topic. Uh, what we know so far, the studies we had so far were small and not controlled, which means that we're providing the intervention and we were uh, testing, oh, uh, does it work, does not work, uh, what can we do in a different way? And there were different approaches, educational, role-playing, uh, behavioral changes. Uh, you can see all those approaches there. Uh, and uh, people over the years came up with certain techniques and tricks to enhance. Uh, so visual cues, um, uh, uh, certain modeling techniques. So very much experiential where people will understand what exactly. So it's not good enough to say when you enter a pub, uh, you need to say no if they offer you a drink. You need to model that. You need to rehearse how they're going to do it. You need to uh, be very specific so they can uh, uh, master the, the sort of behavior they need to do. And of course, there was the big question in the field of intellectual disabilities. Can we do therapy with people with intellectual disabilities? Uh, and in particular, the question is, was about cognitive behavioral therapies, which was you know, the dominant uh, model um, in, uh, uh, in the fields uh, for depression, anxiety. Uh, can we deliver? If the cognition is compromised, there are certain barriers there and challenges, can we do it? Uh, yes, we can do it. And that has been proven. We can use cognitive behavioral therapy with modifications for depression, for anxiety, uh, for obsessional thoughts, uh, and the aim of, was of our uh, trial to see, can we do it for alcohol as well? Um, but there are certain things that you need to take into account. You need to take into account that you need to have longer sessions because they, you need more time to be able to communicate and cover the same content. Um, we need to um, have maintenance sessions, so it's not just good enough to have uh, a number of sessions. You need to go back and rehearse. You need to go back and uh, booster the, what was learned, what was implemented. Um, and to start with, you need to make sure that the system around the individual uh, is supportive and well help them to come to, to the sessions. You can't leave it to just the individual to come to a session. Uh, they need to, you need to help them to start with. And you might need to help them also with how to 
practicing between sessions. You're familiar with CBT. More has to do with practicing between sessions, testing and learning, developing new skills and all that. You need to have the carers and paid carers or family to help them to do that. This was a study. The study was a collaborative study between uh, my trust and myself uh, as a clinician and UCL. Uh, I'm a clinician in addictions, clinical academic addictions, and I collaborated with uh, the uh, learning disabilities academic team uh, at UCL. Uh, the study started in Hertfordshire, which was my previous trust, and when I moved to Saharan Borders, we started recruiting from Saharan Borders, and the uh, Camden and Islington service as well. And it was a feasibility study. Feasibility study means, so that's other, now the regulations around research. Before you get the big amount of money to test, does it work? And the first ever question, remember, is how it works, whom does it work, and how it works. If it works, if you get the money to test the big model, to have a statistical powerful uh, model to give the answer, you need to first of all answer, can we implement the intervention? Can we do research in that population? Can we get data from that population? Uh, so we don't waste uh, money into research. And that's a big uh, debate now in the field. Uh, so it was a feasibility study. It was a randomized controlled trial, which means that we allocated half of the people in the study to receive the intervention, the other half treatment as user, and we'll, treatment as user will say what it is. Uh, it was an, there was an economic evaluation, how much money that, that will cost. Always about the NHS, but you can uh, look into your private uh, settings and all that. And a qualitative component, because in quantitative research, when you look into numbers, you might miss important messages and values for individuals which cannot be measured. So you need to always have a qualitative uh, component there. It was funded by the National Institute of Health Research for 30 months, uh, and it was a collaboration, as I said before. So the people who are people with mild, moderate learning disabilities, they were living in community, in the community. They were living in a wide range of, uh, either within a family, uh, their own family, or they were living in to protect accommodation, either a flat with, um, a support going into a flat or a block of flats or um, a residence that will be several rooms and there will be a team dedicated depending on the needs they had and uh, the risks associated. Um, and uh, we, we approach the professionals to refer to us uh, clients that they thought they had a uh, alcohol problem. So you go to the unit or you go to the families and ask uh, any, any uh, do you know of people that might have an alcohol problem, then you follow the research ethics procedure. So people would have uh, an IQ of uh, below 70, but not too low, so good, but the mild to moderate. Um, they need to be, they had to be score, to score in audits above eight, between eight and 20. So we're looking for people misusing alcohol, not a dependent um, uh, group. And of course, with the audits, because of the problem with the last two questions, we have to really make sure that because we're expecting the overall score to be higher, uh, we didn't want to exclude people who had the misuse. Uh, so we had to look into also the specific questions of the audit that's screened for dependence. So one of the good outcomes about this is that we have now a validated audit tool with change language and the particular cards that we use and all that, uh, that from now on we use of how to screen people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and the service use and the carers, paid or family members were recruited in pairs. So it was the, uh, your subject, your participant, and the most important support person uh, recruited together. And the interesting is that that care was also included into the intervention as well. Uh, <clears throat> treatment as usual was whatever treatment, which was the advice, please don't drink, drink is not good for your health. That is the average as far as it goes in the uh, services now. And those people receive services from, uh, from their GP or could be mental health services or they might not be in touch with services. And the, um, the treatment, the particular intervention was five weeks 
of extended session of 40 minutes uh, with an additional one hour session as a booster a week later, uh, three weeks later. So it was two months intervention, five weekly sessions short, the typical uh, duration for people with without intellectual disability was uh, uh, 20 uh, minutes. We make it, made it double, um, and uh, there was a long session to recap to uh, uh, see what worked, what hasn't worked. And we've done assessments baseline before they start the treatment or treatment as usual uh, in two months, which is roughly the end of treatment and three months. How they maintain what they they got. Um, question, who is going to deliver? Is it going to be an alcohol uh, interventionist or is it going to be someone from learning disabilities? And before, because of the instability of the alcohol services in the NHS and because we thought that the, the, the communication barrier is the main barrier, we thought that it is it's easier to teach, to train people in learning disabilities of how to do alcohol work rather than the other way around. How train alcohol staff, staff with the alcohol service, how to offer, uh, modify their intervention for people with learning disabilities. So we anchored that within the learning disability services. And we had a motivation, a combination of motivation and harassment therapy as was delivered in the UCAT study. If you are familiar, it is still the biggest uh, a study that we have in, in UK on psychological interventions. Uh, and some coping skills training that was uh, uh, developed in an earlier project that I was involved. Um, and what we were doing, we're linking the amount of drinking with the problems they had, the behavioral problems or social problems they had. We helped them to uh, develop competencies to cope with their particular challenges. And that was part of an overall healthy, healthier lifestyle. So we were addressing issues of exercise, of diet, of uh, spending structural time, activities, getting out of home, or choosing the right uh, group of people to go out with. <clears throat> and there was a qualitative study where we took uh, uh, half of the people that uh, had the intervention and their carers and asked them, how did you find the research? How did you find the intervention? Anything in particular you like? Anything in particular you didn't like? And we targeted those that have not completed the intervention and those that uh, didn't start the intervention because we wanted to see at particular barriers. That's the advance of qualitative research. Whatever is lost in numbers, you get it from your qualitative research. Um, what we've learned, you need to involve the service users and the families in order to do that uh, piece of work um, for in the research, but also in, in treatment provision. Um, you need to train your staff of how to do research. You need to use a lot of visual aids to be able to uh, really uh, find the truth and, and not uh, you know, cover up what is going on with uh, the typical bars that you have with people with uh, have learning disabilities. Um, uh, what else have we learned? Uh, the bottom line is this. It st we're still talking about how we're going to go for the big study. It was so challenging to do such a small study, still talking about it. Are we going to include people with autism? Yes or no. Are we going to recruit from GP surgeries? Yes or no. A, can you recruit from GP surgeries nowadays? You know. You know, primary care is in a huge crisis. Can you even go and talk to them about research? So we're still talking about it. Uh, there is a lot of national international interest, but it has been difficult study. Uh, we've learned certain things. We uh, got certain outcomes. Um, the bottom line for us clinicians is that uh, if we suspect that someone has um, intellectual disability, uh, check what sort of school they went to. Uh, get the family, uh, look into that, uh, look into a behavior that uh, there is an imitation, uh, and, and, and allow yourself to feel if uh, they really get the concepts that, uh, that you are talking to, and then you need to modify the way you talk. You need to talk with brief sentences, single concepts, uh, use yes or no, uh, right, wrong, 
all these uh, mannerisms that uh, people with intellectual learning disabilities, they were taught how to use to communicate. So that's about learning disabilities. Are you with me so far? Yeah? Uh, this is the, this, these are the publications we have done. And this is the manual of what we've done. This is available for free. Um, and this is the link. Uh, even if you Google uh, alcohol uh, intervention uh, in learning disabilities, it will come up uh, free to download. So let move, let's move to another group, people with traumatic brain injury. We're going to approach it again, uh, looking into what are the risks, what are the barriers, what are the modifications of services we offer. Uh, and uh, first of all, we're going to start with uh, how big is the problem? Is it a big problem, uh, traumatic brain injury? It is a huge problem. It is not just a small problem is out there. And you can see the extremes there. Every three minutes you have a brain injury uh, and millions of people have that. It is a problem, okay? Which is the opposite of learning disability. Is it a big problem? No, it's, it's less than the average population. This is a huge problem. Does it matter that people have a traumatic brain injury? We have an issue there. The way we assess and the way we approach a traumatic brain injury, we approach it as if the extent and the severity of the injury, that was the current paradigm model, the, the extent and severity of the injury will predict outcome. Wrong. That's not the case. But we, we know that for the last 15, 20 years. But still we operate like that. Why? Because that's the easier way to operate. Someone comes with a traumatic brain injury, you do a CT scan, you do an MRI. CT scan the old days, not sensitive at all. MRI, they have a normal MRI. They have mild symptoms, you send them home. End of story. The severe ones you will treat, the non-severe ones you're going to send them home. As if problem solved. Unfortunately, problem is not solved. Another issue we have is that <clears throat> usually the damage we have or uh, the impact will be in frontal lobe, either because the uh, injury is falling like that, or even if you go back, there will be the secondary movement of the, of the brain, and you're going to have a problem with the frontal lobe one way or another. Why is frontal lobe important? Because frontal lobe is the center of control over our behavior. And we know this is compromised anyway with people who are drinking over a long period of time. We hypothesize with my model that repeated detoxes impair that ability to control behavior if you expose people to several detoxes. Frontal lobe is crucial to be able to make decisions and change behaviors. So if you have a frontal lobe traumatized, by a, an injury that you have, that adds to your problems. And you're going to have other problems as well. You're going to have memory difficulties. So if you're expecting those people to come to your appointments, they might not come unless you involve. You can see that again using the similar model as we've done with learning disabilities, how you need to be aware of the risks and the particular variabilities of that population to be able to not easily say they are not interested in treatment. They are in denial. There is the other, yeah? I'm not devaluing the concept of denial. What I'm saying is that let's not make our life so easy and just focus on the ones that our model works. Let's try to challenge ourselves as practicing uh, clinicians to help as many as we can. We have issues or judgment attention, uh, we have a depression, a low mood, we have a lot of anxiety, and the link between anxiety and depression and alcohol misuse, uh, you know how high it is. What are the special barriers to access treatment? Only 
10% of the traumatic brain injuries will go to acute care. 50% will have findings in the MRI. From those 50%, 10% will have severe symptoms immediately after the injury. And our treatment system focuses on that 10%. Even if you have findings in the MRI and the symptomatology is not high, immediately after the trauma, you are going to be stay for a day or two in the inpatient, in, in the acute hospital, and then you're going to go home. <coughs> the 10% will go to a special neurology-led rehabilitation centers, and where they are going to monitor and receive the support appropriately so, and they will be helped to retrain themselves into how to cope with the sequelae of uh, the traumatic brain injury. Uh, and as we say, the rest of the people will just go back home and nobody will take care of them. So, and that will be all right if the sequelae will diminish in over time and there will be a tail and after a few months everything will be all right. The problem is that the sequelae of it, an index traumatic injury is stay there for a period of time and even more so if that was in the context of a difficult behavior, i.e. alcohol misuse, is more likely there will be another and another, and the traumatic brain injury itself will feed into the risk of having another traumatic brain injury, and the whole thing uh, is escalated. And a difficult, and typical example will be the guy who, was have, uh, who had some movement difficulties, he was in a protected accommodation, uh, somehow the, the staff, and that's a real example from Hansler, the staff uh, were uh, thinking that they were doing the best by uh, restricting his access to his money. Oops. Good intentions, could work. The bottom line is that this man was withdrawn every morning and because he had um, mobility difficulties and he was not on the ground floor, he was on the first floor, he was coming down the stairs crawling. So he was, and several times, of course, he was hitting his head right and left and all that. He had falls the first thing in the morning. And you can see how, you know, minor injuries could increase the risk. So what is the link between alcohol use disorder and TBI? More than half of the people with TBI, they had a drinking problem. Right? So the drink is there before the actual. So the TBI happens in half of the case within a context of drinking. Uh, or they have a history and they are not drinking anymore, but it is within a context of an alcohol use disorder. And those people have more risk of having more severe consequences, long-term consequences from uh, the TBI. And there are different mechanisms there, the acute effect of the alcohol and the neurons and the ability of the neurons to recover from the inflammation, that is the uh, uh, sequelae of, of the injury. But also it has to do with their ability to engage well with our treatment because of memory problems, before, because of risk, because of impulsivity, easily those people will be lost and out of the uh, treatment system because you know, they, they are not ready, because your system is compromised, lack of funding, you are not going to send too many times your assertive engagement team out to, if you don't take into account that we might have a particular issue that compromise their ability. You might have intoxication at the time of the traumatic brain injury, 50% of people. Here is the, the, a problem that overall we have addressed quite well over the last 10 years. Uh, and the days that I was trained as, as a psychiatrist in addictions, the main thing that we were uh, taught when we were doing liaison psychiatry is that anybody who is drunk, uh, you need to assess for traumatic brain injury. Because it's not good enough that, oh, that person is drunk. Don't uh, miss a diagnosis, don't miss an injury just because a person is intoxicated. Because that was what was happening uh, before. So I think we addressed that, that issue. Um, 
The consequences has to do with how they're going to uh, investigate it. If they're intoxicated, you might have issues to get them in to do an MRI or they might have issues staying in hospital. What are you going to do if they try withdrawal? Uh, uh, or they might have uh, difficult behavior. So uh, you need more benzos to control the, the abusive behavior or the withdrawals and all that. So it becomes quite complicated of how to deal with that. And some people will use alcohol to cope with the effect of the traumatic brain injury, the anxiety, the depression, remember what, what we said. Um, and this risk factor is higher with men who are younger and they don't have a support system around them. So these are also the population who is drinking and have a uh, high risk for, for drinking anyway. And if people drink after a traumatic brain injury, they compromise the recovery process for the neurons. So alcohol interacts with the recovery process and makes the process longer and uh, more difficult to engage the service. So they, they, whatever you're going to do is compromise on a biological and service level. You see the rest about antidepressant effect and all that, that makes sense. Once you start thinking about it, then, wow, it's far more than I ever thought about it. We don't know what to do, but think about it. What do we know so far? What does it mean in practice? People who have an, a medical illness or they face suddenly the consequences of their behavior, they're shocked. I was admitted with something that has to do with alcohol. The alcohol liaison nurse or the assessing clinician made that link and said, do you actually understand that what you're doing compromise this? They are in a shock. They say, I'm not going to drink again. Or they say, I'm, I need to stop because my doctor told me that if I don't do it. That shock and that great need to change is going to last for a few weeks. People will go back. If, so it tells us in a way that possibly we need to intervene there and then to capitalize on that shock and help them to change the pre-drinking behavior, pre-traumatic injury behavior, or if they were intoxicated during, then you have better chances to help them say, actually, you know what? Alcohol made you vulnerable to have that, and if you continue drinking even small amounts now, we think, it might compromise your recovery from that injury and actually might increase your chances to have another injury because you might be more impulsive, because your coordination might be affected depending on where is the uh, damage score that anyway fMRI wasn't able to locate. Or we want to preempt the option of people going into drinking to cope with this depression, this anxiety, the inability to focus, concentrate, function at work. Yeah? So maybe time is the element because we need to think, so what are you going to offer if you miss that opportunity? Are you going to, what are you going to offer a year down the line where the alcohol has escalated and whatever uh, compensatory strategies to cope with the traumatic brain injury and the alcohol has established themselves? What are you going to do? Are you going to admit all those people? We're talking about 90% of the people with traumatic brain injury. Are you going to admit them to a residential rehab unit for people with neurocognitive uh, damage? That's very expensive. That is not going to happen. Nobody's going to find anything like that. So we need to do something early enough. And that's what we thought we, were, we wanted to do uh, in collaboration with the local trust in West London. Uh, as an extension of the dementia services, uh, they, we had a team dedicated for people with traumatic brain injury that was operating together with our alcohol liaison service. And they were screening everybody who was coming through uh, the hospital and through the any &E department using their own systems, which is another barrier uh, for traumatic brain injury, and uh, using a more sensitive uh, questionnaire rather than the uh, MRI, which was the diagnostic, and people then referred immediately to a combined service that we dedicated TBI team, and the alcohol liaison was there to preempt the escalation or capitalizing on the shock uh, after the traumatic brain injury. 
and uh, that was a pilot service for, for a year. Uh, we've learned quite a lot. Is a model that, uh, because of financial cuts, stopped in Hanslow, but is, is something that started dialogue nationally that it is an issue and we might have a cheap option of how to screen, identify those people and start thinking of how we can offer better service for them. Because uh, the problem is big, the risk is huge for those people uh, because the problem can go silent and uh, families think that something else is going on. Usually the families will say that his personality changed after his injury. Us, we might think is alcohol, typically alcohol. But the family will say, yeah, he was drinking before, but after the, the incident, uh, things are so somehow different. Uh, and what we do might need to be modified as well. And uh, unfortunately, this is what, what happens. We have traumatic brain injury, and alcohol-related injuries every 40 uh, seconds. Right, and that was my uh, presentation. Uh, two groups, what we started, what, what, we go, what I wanted to do is uh, start looking into paying attention to the special needs, skills, risks of uh, special groups, not to marginalize them, not to uh, put them in a corner, but actually inform whatever treatment model we're using uh, in order to uh, open up our services, whatever treatment service we do, uh, for poor people, for richer people, for the super rich people, it doesn't really matter. Those problems are there. And the example is from Matic Ranger come to mind a uh, senior executive of a uh, very important company in my private practice uh, he comes he, beyond the, the alcohol, alcohol and cocaine use, uh, you can easily spot the mood swings, how hyper he was going, and that was feeding into his alcohol use. But then with a careful history, the whole thing went out of control. So you have, you think, all right, I have alcohol, I have substance use, I have definitely an, a type of bipolar affective disorder that interacts, I'm not sure how, a careful history, two years before, he was attacked outside a club by two or three people because he got in an argument, probably high from cocaine and alcohol, and he was admitted to hospital for two days with traumatic brain injury, came out, and nobody took, everything was fine. Yeah, he couldn't concentrate to start. Yeah, his mood was compromised. Yeah, he had issues with, with that. The bottom line is that since then, he and his wife said that, the whole thing became worse. He couldn't even control his impulsivity at home. He was entering into more arguments, and alcohol became a, a, a more like an escape rather than a feeding into his hyper behavior from time to time. So uh, that, that, that issue can happen anywhere, private clinic, uh, NHS uh, services. Thank you for your attention. We have time for discussion.